Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs in the Paranormal. I call this episode Government UFO Insider. This is all about a gentleman I'll call Thomas. That's not his real name. He prefers to remain anonymous and once you hear his story I think you'll see why. Thomas is a retired Navy veteran who very nearly became involved in the secret government. He was asked to join the secret government and a project involving crashed and retrieved UFOs. He has a very interesting story to tell. I've corresponded with him for many years and he's finally agreed to tell his story. So that's what this video is about today. Thomas's story actually begins when he was just a little boy. He's always been fascinated by the paranormal, the supernatural, cryptozoological creatures such as the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot. All of this stuff fascinated him and it was a huge hobby of his. He's also a huge believer in UFOs, has been his whole life, because of what his father told him. Thomas's father was stationed at Fort Ord in California back in 1954 and 1955 and he told Thomas that it was his job, actually, to guard a 48-foot-wide extraterrestrial craft that was being held in secret at Fort Ord. As it turns out, Fort Ord does have quite a complicated UFO history with several UFO encounters occurring there. Uh, so Thomas eventually joined the military. He became a part of the Navy and uh, enjoyed a very successful career there, moved up in rank, and was finally discharged following a pretty severe accident. In 1981, he suffered an accident and was honorably discharged and retired from the military. Uh, but he maintained his interest in the military and had quite a few friends within the military. And in 1991, the internet uh, started to become really popular and publicly available. And he started to use the internet to research the UFO subject. He joined an online UFO chat room on AOL Online, one of the first internet providers and began talking with other military people about UFOs. And one of the people he started corresponding with used the screen name MJ3. And MJ3 had some very interesting things, some very interesting information to share with Thomas. And as Thomas says, and I quote, he started asking about my military background. I told him that I had a secret clearance in the Navy for the ship I was on. We were all stationed aboard the USS Kidd DDG-993. I had to have a secret clearance because of some special devices that they had on board, electronic manipulation for the radars. After being out of the Navy for 10 years, I can talk about it now. It's declassified and basically the information is available to the public now. But I started chatting with him, and after about a week and a half of communication, I came to find out he was an officer in the Pentagon. So they chatted quite a bit, and at one point during their chats, MJ3 asked him a very interesting question. He asked Thomas, Would you like doing research for one of our groups? And Thomas said that he was curious about this question and what exactly was this. And the officer said, somebody will be contacting you down the road. So as it turned out, Thomas qualified for a program called Chapter 31. This is for disabled veterans. And because Thomas was injured while in the Navy, he qualified for this program and was able to get funds which allowed him to attend college. 
and Thomas was attending classes at Shasta College in California. And this was when he was approached on the campus by a gentleman who was a complete stranger to him, but seemed to know quite a bit about Thomas. And as Thomas says, I never met the guy before in my life, but he seemed to know who I was. It kind of freaked me out. So we started talking back and forth, and he said that he was a friend of MJ3's and that he was here to give me a rundown on what the job entailed and so forth. And he said I would have rank plus one. So this really intrigued Thomas because he actually did quite well in the Navy. Uh, he, of course, started with a rank of E1, but rose all the way to E5. And if you know your Navy rankings, this is basically the equivalent of a sergeant. So Thomas already had a pretty high ranking when he left the Navy, and now he was basically being offered a promotion. As Thomas says, this plus one said that any situation that I got into, I would have control of the situation. So if I went to a plane crash per se, I would have control of the landing site. So this was interesting. So what's interesting about this is this gentleman who introduced himself to Thomas said his name was George Sparks. That also is a pseudonym. But George told Thomas all about this and sort of inf inferred that these plane crashes were really not plane crashes, but rather UFO crashes. He didn't say this directly, but that was absolutely the inference. And Thomas replied that he was still interested. And George told him that he would be contacted later. So it was just a few months later, and George was at this time working for the Veterans Clinic in Redding, California. And he was just doing basic office work. And this is when something very strange happened. As Thomas says in his own words, I was basically a gopher, filing papers, shredding stuff, the whole nine yards. And I'm sitting there going through the files, putting the files back to the file room and alphabetizing them when, lo and behold, I come up with the medical file of George Sparks, the same guy I had met at Shasta College. And the funny thing about it, on the outside of the file, it said, Eyes Only, Top Secret. Well, all top secret files are supposed to be kept in the administrator's office. As far as me being an administrative aide, even with a secret clearance, I am not supposed to handle that type of material. They're not supposed to be open to anybody in administration. I knew it was a no-no for this file to be out, so I took it to the administrator's administrative officer. As it turns out, the officer was outraged and said, what are you doing with this file? Thomas replied, I'm returning it to you, sir, because I know that it's not supposed to be out in the general files. So his boss was not happy, and as Thomas says, I basically got the third degree. It was supposed to be under lock and key, and I got my ass royally chewed out and so forth. Uh, Thomas knew what, exactly what was going on. This was clearly a setup. As he says, I know why it was on my desk. It was to give Sparks' background. So it was really no surprise to Thomas when a few weeks later, this same gentleman, George Sparks, showed up at the Veterans Clinic as a fellow employee working right along with Thomas. And they began to talk. And this is when George revealed exactly what this so-called job would entail. And told him, told Thomas, that he would be part of a group called the Omega Group. The Red Team and the Omega Group. And it was all about UFO crash retrievals. As Thomas says, in Omega... 
when there's a crash of a vehicle, what Omega does is they send out what they call a red team. The red team goes and encircles the area, sets the outer perimeter. When the local military come in, they place them in the outer perimeter, and then they, the red team, basically search and destroy to the crashed vehicle. In this case, a UFO, or some sort of extraterrestrial vehicle. So Thomas, of course, uh, always knew UFOs were real, had heard of UFO crashes, but here he is getting first-hand information and being invited to become a part of this project. This is what we now know is called Project Pounce, part of Project Aquarius, which is an official government project to recover crashed UFOs. So as Thomas says, we worked together on and off for about a week, and he came to me about a week down the road and said, well, if you want to do what we talked about, you need to contact the police science at blank college. And basically what he told me about the commitment was, once in, never out. I could never have contact with my family ever again. I could never have a relationship. Well, I was just starting one with my girlfriend, now my wife. I'd have to drop that, which I could never. So as tempting and as mind-blowing as this opportunity was, Thomas ultimately declined and said no. As he says, I just let it go. Uh, but now, he, although he declined, he had sort of a pipeline of information directly into this secret government group. He knew it existed. He knew people who were in it. And he was very intrigued and attempted to learn as much as he could about it while staying on the outskirts of this group. And in 1993, still online uh, in these UFO chat rooms, he connected with another gentleman who we'll call Harry Jameson. This is again a pseudonym. And by coincidence or not, Harry Jameson was actually a member of the Red Team in Project Omega, the very group that Thomas had been invited to join and declined to do so. So yeah, this is part of Project Pounce, Project Aquarius, to recover crashed UFOs. And Harry Jameson had quite a bit of interesting information to share with Thomas. And what he said was that there was a lot of UFO activity during the Vietnam War. And Harry Jameson was part of a project uh, in which they actually recovered UFOs during the Vietnam War. So I'll just let Thomas talk about what he learned in his own words. As Thomas says, he said that back in the military, he had been part of a group. He was in Omega Red. He was in Vietnam as a sergeant and got a field promotion to major, or I don't know what, and was put in a multi-service force. At the time, they were referred to as Dragon Slayers. They were LRPs, Long Range Reconnaissance. These are two-man sniper teams, a shooter and a spotter. They are given a photograph and they are taken out in a helicopter, dropped off in the middle of nowhere near their target, and then they sneak their way to the target, eliminate them, and come back. That was their primary mission. The secondary mission, if I understand correctly, they were the initial groups of Project Pounce. If you start doing your research, Project Pounce was the recovery of downed vehicles. And these guys were gung-ho. They were given orders and they did what they were told to do, whether it be with the Red Team or not. To my understanding, there were three vehicles that went down in Vietnam and our government this black ops group went in, put the perimeter up, 
took the regular military and used them for the outer areas, and basically anything that was between the outer perimeter and the vehicle was eliminated, killed, whether it be animal, man, or alien. They wanted technology, and they didn't give a rat's ass who they killed to get it. They went in and laid defoliant into the jungle. That way they could find the vehicle faster. They were all about getting the technology, and they didn't care who they killed to do it. So Harry Jameson told Thomas that the real use of Agent Orange wasn't so much about you know, the enemy, but was really used as a resource to help aid them in the recovery of these downed UFOs. So this is what Harry Jameson told Thomas. And following Harry's uh, work in Vietnam, Harry returned to the United States and was stationed at Area 51 as a security guard where he worked for a number of years, but the work was just too stressful, it was too much for Harry, and he requested to be let out. Well, of course, once you're in the Omega team, it's once in, never out. Uh, but Harry apparently got an exception, but it was at a very high price. Uh, Harry told Thomas that he got out, but um, to get out, he had to undergo brainwashing. Apparently, he was approached by a gray alien who completely erased his memory of his entire service at Area 51 and in Vietnam as well. So Harry Jamerson was released from the Omega team and Project Pounce and all of this and lived a normal life, as far as you could tell, until he had a severe car accident. And as a result of this car accident, Harry Jameson's memories started to return, and he recalled his involvement with Project Pounce in Vietnam and his work as a security guard at Area 51. And Harry had a very interesting to story to tell Thomas. And Harry said that uh, Area 51 is real. It goes many levels underground. And in fact, there are many deep under, underground military bases across the United States. What we now know are called DUMS. And that in fact, not only are there underground bases crisscrossing the United States, but there's a tunnel system of huge tunnel system going all across the United States. Uh, Thomas told me that, uh, in fact, Harry told him that there is a tunnel go reaching from Area 51 all the way to Edwards Air Force Base in uh, the high desert in California, all the way to the Santa Catalina Channel. And that's just one of many of these tunnels. So we know that there are a lot of tunnels and underground bases. Researchers have done a lot of work into this, particularly Richard Sauter, who has really probably the leader into the research of underground bases and tunnels crisscrossing the United States. So this is some of the information that Harry was giving to Thomas. As Thomas says, and again I quote, I got curious, and I started asking Jameson about the tunnel systems. And the way he said it to me was, I'm not telling you this, but you mean the ones that you can fly an assault helicopter through? In one of our conversations, Jameson told me about a submarine base there at Area 51, and how tunnel systems exist all through the continental United States, and go to what they call the dumb bases, deep underground military bases. I learned about the dumb bases. And I learned that the United States is funneling about one and a quarter trillion dollars a year toward black ops projects. 
And it's not necessarily only the U.S. government that's doing it. The U.S. government itself is kind of in the dark about this. The executive branch, our government structure, it's a facade. It's a pacification to keep us pacified while the secret government is playing their own games. It's not the White House that's in control. It's the Pentagon. So this was the information that Harry Jameson was telling Thomas. And he had some really interesting information about Area 51. Now, Area 51 is, of course, a super famous UFO story. Uh, there are a lot of whistleblowers coming out of Area 51. Of course, we all know about Bob Lazar. Bob Lazar is, of course, the one who really put Area 51 on the map. But Bob Lazar is only one of many, many whistleblowers who have information about Area 51. Of course, there's Bill Uhouse, another gentleman who said he worked with an, a gray alien by the name of J-Rod. I was able to meet Bill Uhouse face to face. I can tell you he's a very kind and sincere gentleman. So he's another Area 51 whistleblower. And there are others. Another would be Boyd Bushman. Uh, another is Dan Burish. There are many. There's another one by the name of Robert Miller. These are all controversial figures, to say the least. And uh, some people have accused them of hoaxing. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, all of, the, all of them have come under vicious attacks of one kind or another, but their stories match each other's, and they're not the only ones who are coming out with this kind of information about Area 51. In fact, in a prior video I did about UFOs over Nevada, the top 20 cases, I covered Area 51 in depth, and a lot of the information coming out from these whistleblowers absolutely does match up. And what Harry Jameson had to t say about Area 51 uh, is really quite mind-blowing. And uh, he told Thomas all about what he learned. So over the next five years, Thomas corresponded with Harry Jameson and learned all about his job at Area 51. And I'll just let Thomas describe it in his own words. As Thomas says, here's some details. At Area 51, there is a hangar at the northern end of a runway that they call Hangar Delta, the Green Door. And the Green Door is an access point to an elevator system. And this elevator goes all the way to an underground base. To my understanding, this underground city is called Phoenix and has a population of about 10,000 people. This is not only humans, but alien friends. From conversations with Jameson, what I've come to find out is that there are about seven different races existing at that facility at the lower levels of the base. There are 15 levels to the base, and the last five levels are alien crew quarters. As you got into those levels, there were different atmospheres depending on the alien. From what I understand, they didn't go into the lower level unless there was a drastic need. And then, whenever they went into the lower levels, they always had an escort. They always had their alien counterparts with them. So Jameson told Thomas uh, that he had been down to these lower levels a few times and that his alien counterpart, his guide, was none other than J-Rod, as talked about by Bill Uhouse and other Area 51 whistleblowers. And as uh, Thomas says, this alien was one of the Zeta Reticuli, one of the science class or the diplomat class of aliens. They were like an ant colony. 
their existence is very telepathic and non-emotional. Jameson told Thomas that he had a top secret Umbra clearance, which is pretty much one of the top clearances, top secret clearances you can get. And uh, later, Thomas was actually able to meet Harry Jameson face to face and uh, speak with him. And he not only met Jameson face to face, he was able to meet with other members of the Omega team who verified Jameson's identity. So this is most of what Jameson, or rather Thomas, learned about what's going on in the secret government. But he did have one other really freaky and somewhat uh, alarming experience. It really quite disturbed him. Uh, he was talking to one of these officers, a military officer who was involved, a part of the Omega team, when something amazing happened. Uh, he thought this gentleman was a normal human, but it turned out he wasn't. And as Thomas says, he was a shapeshifter. I was standing five feet in front of him when he changed to a gray. So this showed Thomas just how advanced grays are and that they can put on a screen memory and appear as a completely normal human being. This is Thomas's experience. Uh, I can tell you that while I can't prove Thomas is telling the truth, I was able to verify his identity, his employment on the USS Kid, and that his testimony is matching up with what other whistleblowers are saying. Uh, Thomas is still doing his research into this subject uh, and trying to find out all he can. He often wonders what his life would have been like if he had said yes to this offer to join the secret government. But ultimately, he's glad he declined and lived a normal life because he felt like it would have been too lonely and too stressful. And after seeing what Harry Jameson had to go through, yeah, Thomas is glad he declined. Uh, but he's also glad <laughs> that he was able to get sort of a pipeline of information to what is going on. And he feels like it's really important that people know how deeply involved our government is involved in the UFO subject. And I agree, and that's why I wanted to do this video. I did tell Thomas's story in my new book, Wondrous, 25 True UFO Encounters. It's one of a few whistleblower accounts that I was able to include in this book. I feel it's important testimony I feel like it's important people know that there is a government cover-up, that our government is neck deep involved in this subject, and despite their denials about the reality of UFOs, they know full well that it is real and are spending an enormous amount of time, money, and effort to study this subject. Uh, so that's why I wanted to do this video. So I hope you've enjoyed this story. I hope you learned something. really want to thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. So that's it for now. Keep searching for the truth. And more importantly, until next time, keep having fun.